Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Be You Babe Cop podcast, where we talk all about being your authentic self and what you're here to truly express. Today, I am so excited to have Adela on the podcast, and she and I were just chatting, and I, this is going to be such a fantastic conversation. But first, Adela is the founder of Startups and & Co. and is the master of helping you pitch your business to, help, um, to people that you don't know yet. And so curious about this, but I first want to just welcome you with open arms, Adela. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Rachel. (laughs) It's going to be so good. Tell the audience a little bit more about you, how you kind of got to this. You didn't know human design, which we dove in a little bit. Um, You're right on the mark always, but what... How did you get to this point of really, truly being able to express yourself confidently um, and just be be you? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Good question. Love it, love it. Well, it actually started in um, here in the city of London, where 20, 22 years ago, I was, uh, well, it's, it, it, was, it was in an interesting side of corporate. I used to be a management consultant for a company called Accenture. And um, I would go around, and I don't know if you've watched the movie uh, Up in the Air with George Clooney, where he goes around and transforms companies by firing departments. Um, And I was the person that was wheeled in, not necessarily to do the firing, but to identify the departments that weren't performing very well. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was a really tough environment to be in. But what I noticed within that first year of being in what what was called outsourcing at the time in in the world of tech was that um, other all the guys in the office, all the men in the office would get promoted, um, and I wasn't getting promoted. I wasn't moving mm-hmm. up the ranks. And I thought, why is this? Why am I not getting promoted? Yeah. And one day I spoke to a partner who I was really good friends with. And he said, you know why you're not getting promoted? Because no one knows what you're working on. No one knows what you want to be working on. No one knows what you stand for. Um, You know, this guy over there in the office, I mean, this guy who used to get promoted looked a bit like Ryan Gosling, right? And I used to, you know, he was like Ryan Gosling's better looking brother. And I used to roll my eyes. I was like, oh, of course you're going to get promoted. You look like Ryan Gosling. But actually the partner said to me, the reason why your Ryan Gosling friend, you know, is getting promoted is because he's going to all the other senior managers in the office and telling them what he wants to be working on. He's Mm. telling them what he's passionate about, what he Mm. enjoys doing. He's telling them where, which countries he wants to work in. So he's already communicating his brand and putting himself quite literally out there. Whereas (laughs) what I was doing, the very classic female thing, which was if I just stay in the corner of the office and put my head down and do the work, someone will notice Mm me Mm -hmm. and actually I realized then that it was you know 60 percent 70 percent of doing the work and 30 percent promoting doing your own PR and Mm. so I learned the hard way by missing out on on money missing out on money at an early age and then realizing that I had to do that so that was that was where I learned it especially as a woman of color as well so as a woman of color you're you struggle a little bit in the corporate world amongst a sea of white men. So I had to even, you know, work extra hard at promoting myself and and it paid off. The minute I did it, it started to pay off. I really want to talk. Oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. So I want to talk about as a projector, because you're emotional projector and the idea of waiting for an invitation is kind of this online weird thing that some people say that you have to wait to really talk about what you do, which I do not agree with at all. I think as a projector, when you are using your energy in, in alignment, in a way that you feel really confident in what you do and you know that you're really good at it and you just share it, that invitations to come to you. So I would love to know when you started in like your own PR stuff, How did that play into it? Um, And how did you learn to talk about yourself in a way that didn't feel like awkward? Yeah. So let me give you an example of of this, right? So 
when I quit consulting and I started um, in 2016 a fashion business um, here in London, fashion was a re- is, a, is a really, really crowded market, especially mm-hmm. here in Europe. Mm-hmm. And the minute I started my fashion business, I was talking about it to everyone I knew. Uh, actually, I was talking about it six months before as I was planning the business and working everything out. So that by the time I actually launched the business, I was already in a corporate office with all my ideal clients sitting in the room, looking at my product, listening to me speak and and handing their credit card over to buy my service, right? And the reason that happened was because of two things. Firstly, I knew that if you don't talk about your business, if you don't take the steps to get visible in the beautiful work that you do no one will know you exist and this is so so important especially for this community your audience of spiritual healers yes you know there's a tendency to give away a lot of your good work that you do and and i totally understand it right i Mm -hmm. i lived in bali uh for in in 2016 um in that very deep spiritual community so I understand that community Mm -hmm. and what it feels like Mm -hmm. to not want to be paid for it and to not want to talk about it and just to focus on doing your good work right yeah but if you don't talk about your business if you don't spend an active time a period of time each week finding collaborations talking to people actively Mm -hmm. connecting with customers actively connecting with people in your network who offer complimentary, you mm-hmm. know, services to your what you do, you won't grow your business. And the yeah. sad thing is, if you don't grow your business, when a pandemic comes along like we've had, your business will not be able to weather the, the, those yeah. shocks. Yeah. So yeah. you've got to create a recession-proof, a risk, risk-proof risk business. And the only way of doing it is by getting visible and actively talking about your business. So that's the first reason why you need to get visible. The second reason is if you are someone who is deeply spiritual, Mm -hmm. this is the reason that will connect with you more, which is if, especially if you're not kind of business minded, you're real pure healer is that you want to be reaching more and more people with your good work. So if you don't actively talk about your business, there is someone out there who might be crying out for your service right now. Yeah. And you not talking about your business means you can't help them. They can't mm-hmm. find you. Yeah. And, and you can't make an impact on that human. Yeah. So it's so important for you to, to talk about your business for those two reasons. Yeah. I totally agree with the first one that it's, you are the first and foremost advocate for your own business. No one's going to care as much about your business as you do. And yes. if you're not out there talking about it, no one else will. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Oh, exactly. God. Oh, Adela, so, so good. Um, and a hundred percent, I know I've felt into those of like, I wasn't confident in what I did, so I yeah. didn't want to talk about it. How did you find that confidence in what you do so that it felt easier to talk about what you do? <laughs> yeah, I love this question. And it's, it's a question I often get asked, right? Cause I, I have my own program. It's called Pitch to Press where I support entrepreneurs and coaches and healers on how to get confident with their business. And the first thing I say to all those individuals is, uh, it's my favorite phrase, actually. We've turned it into a bit of an affirmation, Mm. um, which is journalists are not gods. And what that means is, it doesn't matter whether it's a journalist or a course creator or a podcaster or a blogger, whoever you're pitching to, whoever you are telling your story, they need to hear your story because without your story, they can't create the content. Mm. So right now, so let's yeah. get let's get meta with this. Right now, yeah. I'm on your podcast and I'm I'm telling you my story, right? Yep. But if I chose not to do it. You wouldn't have a guest for today's podcast, you you know, so it stops you from doing the work that you want to do as well. So yeah. this is a, a little reframe. It's like, um, uh, why f- it's a reframe. And the reason I do this reframe is because people who struggle with confidence, mm-hmm. they often, there's, there's a couple of aspects of fear, but the first fear is, um, I'm not good enough for those people 
you know, on yep. that pedestal. I'm not good enough yep. for that journalist. I'm not good enough for that podcaster. Yep. Um, what I try to do is flip that and say, you absolutely are good enough. You're so good that if you don't tell your story, yeah. those people are going to fail. Yeah. They're going to fail. They don't have Love content that. to post that day. Yeah. So you've yep. got a care of duty of care yeah. to pitch that person. And yeah. when they hear, there's so many people, I, I, this is the first principle I teach in post press. And when they hear that, they're like, oh, I never thought of, of, of pitching that way. And, they, and it, it, it suddenly flips. It suddenly flips to that individual. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, I always also say, what's the worst that can happen when you pitch to someone? That's when you true. start telling your story? <laughs> Get a sheet of, <laughs> exactly. Get a sheet of white paper. But what's the worst that can happen in the middle of the paper? And just write down all the mm. things that could go wrong. Yeah. And actually your brain then goes into like logic problem solving mode. And you realize there's actually no major fears no. there. No. You've just blown it up in your own head. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a confidence issue, but it's more of, I, you know, I just don't know where to start with this. It's, it's more of a skill thing rather than a yeah, confidence thing. Yeah, that's so true. Um, <laughs> you know, you're not confident when you do something for the first time. It is like you're, you know, on a bike and you've never ridden a bike before and you're yeah. wobbly. You just don't like, ah, I don't know what's happening. Right. Yeah. Um, versus being like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a skill, right? Like show oh, me yeah. people in, in the online coaching world, like in the healing world, in this like, well, personal development industry, right? Yeah. People will invest time in, and money in learning how to like write good emails, build a website, you know, mm -hmm. branding, design, copy. Mm -hmm. But very few people actually invest in upskilling themselves and how to pitch their business, how to do their own PR, how to be visible, how to build relationships. That for me is like a fundamental part of your business. So mm -hmm. if you don't know what to do, give yourself the grace and just realize no one was born with that skill. Like it's something that you need to learn, like writing a good email, like doing your accounting for a business, you know, like putting out an offer. Yeah. Can we talk about the I help statements? Because this is something yeah. that... <laughs> I get why people do it. And I get why that's been like the, um, I guess the guru advice is I help X do blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I feel like it always miss ends up missing the mark and people think it's really clear, but it's not. And it also does nothing for sharing their story or yes. really making them unique and stand out. How do you suggest for your clients, um, to kind of pitch and talk about what they do in a really short format? Yeah, brilliant question. Love this question. So I do recommend like having like your back pocket help statements, right? Because if you can't summarize what you do in a couple of sentences, um, you know, you may run the risk of just waffling a lot of times that you, totally. that you meet new people. So it is yep. a good exercise to do. That said, you do need, like stories are just so much more powerful. They like, yeah. you know, if you look back to when we were four or five years old, we can always remember those nursery rhymes and those stories that we read as children or we heard as children, we watched as children, you know, all those nursery rhymes we may have listened to in the school playground, but we can't remember what someone wrote in an email a week ago. Yeah. And, and the reason is because those <laughs> stories stand the test of time. So I really recommend for you, for everyone listening today, start to work out your story. What is a story that you are super comfortable with telling that relates to your business? And lots of people mm -hmm. call it the origin story, the founder story, but Really, it's thinking about what's what's made you start your business. What, why are you doing mm -hmm. the work that you're doing? Like, what mm -hmm. makes you get up in the morning? Like, what's the deeper reason for that? Mm -hmm. Do an exercise, which is, you know, when you get to an answer. When, so if I said to you, why do you wake up in the morning? Um, and you say, uh, I wake up in the morning because I want to help women who've had some trauma, um, release that trauma through Reiki, right? Okay. Then I'll turn around and say, why? Mm. Right? And then you go down one layer and you say, well, because of, you know, um, uh, you know, something happened when I was young, blah, blah, blah. And I, sh I saw women in my community had a lot of trauma and I go, why? Mm. 
and yeah. why and then why yeah. we get deeper yeah. and deeper yeah. and deeper until you get to the core so it's like we're peeling layers of an onion trying to get to that inner core of what the root of the story is yeah. um and ask yourself when you get to that when you do that exercise what is it that I feel comfortable with sharing mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. because sometimes you know it may be that you might I'm just plucking out examples here but it may be that you know someone listening today trigger warning but someone may have had some trauma or abuse in their household when they were growing up yeah. and so there's a deeper reason but you've got to ask yourself if you feel comfortable with sharing that yeah. because before you start talking about that story you need to know whether you feel comfortable with that you don't want to be having an emotional hangover no. a vulnerability hangover with anyone yes. that you want to podcast with with a journalist yeah. with a fellow entrepreneur yeah. you need to know what feels good to you when you tell your story because if yeah. you're crying your eyes out on to a journalist or a, a fellow entrepreneur every time you tell a story that, that might not be the right story to tell so yeah that's so so true it does need to be a story that you've grown through and healed and you're not vulnerable around anymore yeah. i love that like it has to be something that you're like yeah this happened i yeah. learned this through that process and now i can really stand in my own worthiness my own enoughness my own confidence yes. and help other people through it because yes. i'm now on the other side yeah yes true exactly especially yeah. because especially in, in the space that your audience is in Rachel it's, it's very vulnerable right you're in a healing yep. space yeah there's a lot of vulnerability and you need to think ethically yes when um, you're developing the copy for your website when you're mm -hmm. framing pictures to people mm -hmm. when you're telling your story on Instagram you don't want to be triggering people but you yeah. do want to be sharing that story so you've got to think like very carefully yeah are you pushing people's pain points here too far so yes. yeah. i mean these are these are, we could we could talk about that <laughs> oh my gosh can we talk That's about pain points? Rabbit hole, right. <laughs> but, pain points are yeah. well i get that we do need to like meet people where they're at and really um, yes. you know show that we understand where they're at we can't laminate and just be in that pain constantly and yeah, yeah. over and we nobody wants to be in that pain so when you're sitting there identifying on and on and on and on about it it we check out we're like i can't i you know and you get stuck in that victimhood um yeah. and you end up attracting people that are in victimhood that can't are, are not ready to fix their problem, right? And they're not willing yes. to pay the money. They're not, right? Instead of flipping and saying, I understand where you're at, let's let's move out of it. Yeah, uh, and I, I wanna mention here, there's a really great expert I know, a lady called Sage Polaris, who I don't know if anyone listening may have heard of her, but she has, her whole philosophy is conscious copy. So mm -hmm. I recently interviewed her in a summit that I did called the Spotlight Salon, where we had this conversation. This is a very conversation. I really encourage everyone here listening to go to um, itsorspotlight.com and sign up for that summit and listen to the interview I did with Sage Polaris, because she talks about how you can avoid always leading with that pain point. And what yes. you can do instead you so you're not can. triggering yeah. people so yeah oh, yes oh i love that yes a hundred percent you do not have to leave with a pain point um yeah so good yes um there is one question that i had before i interview our elephant in the room question oh yes all about um how this like feminine energy has risen and girl boss kind of vibes, but it's all a little bit still selling sex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She knew. I was I also, I also, um, I, I laughed when we first touched on this question because you mentioned you, you talking about the elephant in the room question because you'd read my email to my email list today. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I have no idea that you're on my email list. So I love it, you know. And so for me, that, that I just before I even touch on onto that question, I just want to say if there's anyone right now who is emailing their email list once or twice a week and they think think no one is reading my emails, <laughs> and you know, I'm a, I'm British, right? And I I can be a you know I can be very visionary but I can also be a little bit cynical and so I see my stats for my email list oh. from ConvertKit and I have a very high open rate but for some reason I have my own like issues and I think well ConvertKit stats are wrong <laughs> 
they're all a lie. And then today you said, I read your elephant in the room email. So um, you read it, you read it. So I just want to honor that, that, that people do read your emails. When you think you're not being visible, yeah. people are quietly watching you from yes. the sidelines. They that really is so, are. so true that even when you put stuff out there and no one's commenting, no one's replying back, there's nothing. Yeah. There are people that are watching and listening yeah. and they're yeah. just like, there's something at some point will tick them over where they will comment. They will sign yeah. up for something, buy something. Definitely, like, definitely. Where did everyone you come from? Join, exactly. So everyone join my email list because you might get some gold for when you interview someone like Rachel today. You will 100% get gold. To, to, to ask me a question. It's, like, it's just getting so, it's just like getting my, my, email, my interviews get very meta, don't they? Um, so this is, this is, so let's get serious then. Your question, your elephant in the room question is such a good one. Um, are women, actually, uh, is your question right? Are women using sex to sell in the in the kind of healing industry? Is that what you're saying? Like how, well, when they present themselves, is there too much sexuality at play? I think it's even more of do we have to be like that in order yes. to sell, right? Yes. I see, and, uh, and there's a few different brands out there that are on that. Like I don't want to call them out because I think that everybody you do you, right? Yeah, At the yeah. end of the day, you do you. But yes. in some ways it feels a little bit like you have to have this like sexy image, this, you know, bikini clad, lots of skin, um, high end lifestyle in order to be truly successful and sell your program. Yes. And I know that myself, I don't want to show up like that. That's not me. I know yes. a lot of the people in my audience are that way. They're like, that's not me. Um, can I still be successful? Yes. Is yes. the question on their mind, right? Yes. Can I still be successful? You absolutely can. Yeah. Let me just try and dispel that myth of that bikini lifestyle, because I was right in the heart of it in 2016 in Bali. So I was living in Bali. Um, Bali Uber particularly attracts those digital nomads in yep. that bikini lifestyle. So yep. I was there for four months as an expat. Um, working in the same space as them and let me just just destroy that myth for you in one <laughs> second please, please do the people who had the most mental health issues often lived in Bali because they were trying to keep up with content creation and living this lifestyle uh you know they're on scooters taking pictures of their a, a, I can never pronounce that word. This acai bowls, you know, the Brazilian bowls that you oh, get. Oh, acai bowls or acai bowls? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They were trying to take pictures of these bowls, uh, you know. But no one ever shows you the side of Bali where the monkeys are really aggressive and they steal your laptops. I'm, I'm, I kid you not. It sounds funny. No one ever tells you about, you know, sadly, trigger warning here, but people like standing on the edge of the bridge in Bali, like not feeling well at all. There's some really strong yeah. stories or um, some of the perversions that happen there and the vulnerability oh. of, of women going there and people preying on them and that all and this is some really dark stuff that happens there yeah. so anyone who creates beautiful curated instagram grids of themselves on gilly tea and hey check out my pool lifestyle they are working goldman sachs hours in a sweaty office you know yeah worried about healthcare because they can't they don't have good hospitals you know their visas about to run out their business isn't making money I mean, I'm, I'm trying to give you the negative sides, but no, you, you, no one tells the dark stories behind that lifestyle. So I really oh. saw it for four months. So I just want to dispel that myth for anyone who's listening. And I have friends who for three years were digital nomads. So some of my closest friends are digital nomads. Mm -hmm. um, it's what they were, they, the word changes, right? They, one yeah. minute it was location independent. The next minute it's a digital nomad. They, they love to change the terminology, but um no one ever talks about the dark side, about the fact that you're not with your family, not with your friends. The community is yeah. constantly changing, very mm -hmm. lonely lifestyle. So it's a curated lifestyle for Instagram. So, and I really want to just love, thank you for sharing that because I yeah. love that it just highlights even more how much Instagram is a tiny snippet yes. and how people and myself include, we compare all of our shit to yeah. that and not yeah. realizing 
and giving crazy. your own self credit for how far we've come, what we've yeah. been able to accomplish, our own story, right? Feel yeah. that we diminish our own story because it's not as exciting as Bali or, you know, like, oh, I just, it, I love that. I don't know. It validates so much. <laughs> Yeah. And I just wanted to lift the lid on that. And I know yeah. I'm like, hopefully I don't sound too ranty about it, but I, I think it's very important to share the reality of what I saw mm -hmm. rather than yeah. uh, continue to perpetuate that, that yeah. highly mm -hmm. curated lifestyle that is only 1% of what's really going on. Like yeah. people were working Goldman Sachs hours in that office, like 16 hour days, 12 hour days, putting out content. And I was there, I was with those crowds. So yeah. I, I know I, I've just given you some insight there, but back to your original question around um, this, like, do we have to be like those people that use their image mm -hmm. or sell a lifestyle in order to sell our healing services and yeah. what we do? Yes. You don't have to be like those people. And I, I agree. I really encourage people, everyone listening today, to think about what feels good to you when you sell, when you try mm -hmm. to talk to your, your, your prospective clients, your audience. How do you want to show up? How do you want to be known, right? Because, you know, if you start putting out images that don't feel good to you in your core, mm -hmm. And you, you know, yeah. people can read between the oh. lines oh, and they 100%. know it's yeah. fake. They know yeah. that something's not right. Yeah. So I, for one, I'm not the kind of person who likes to use my image a lot. I know that when I talk about my work, I like to connect with my audience. They like to see my face. Mm -hmm. If I had my way, I would probably just be doing a lot of written nerdy content, but I know that wouldn't necessarily land. Yeah. So I, but there is another reason why I do show my face on Instagram. And that is because as a woman of color, I feel I have to be a leader for yeah. other women of color because there's like 1% yeah. of us in a sea of, uh, you know, women who, white women who don't yep. look like me yep. and other women of color. So yeah. I have to stand out. So I've tied being facially visible on mm -hmm. social media mm -hmm. with that deeper mission. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I do think that like, at the end of the day, we want to do business with people that we see, you know, like it, yes. you're more than just something on the screen. Like you're a human yes. being, you're a person yes. and I want to do business with a person. <laughs> yeah. And people yeah. like to see the yeah. real you, like yeah. how you're building your business, the behind the scenes of your business. So yeah. it, it, Again, it comes back to work out what you feel comfortable with sharing yeah. and what you don't feel comfortable with sharing. Yeah. So, you know, I have a principle. I never um, show my family on Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I rarely mention my family in my emails. You know, I have a kind of one or two mentions, but very rarely. Yeah. And that is a very deliberate, uh, conscious decision. There are other people in my industry who will project their family all over their Instagram grid. Yeah. Um, and that's their decision, right? Yep. But I've come to my own decision because my daughter is, you know, she's four years old and I haven't got her permission. So mm -hmm. I don't want her to turn around when she's 18 and say, hey, you've put 10 years of my life on Instagram without my permission and I'm not a consenting adult. So mm -hmm. it's for me, it's a very, uh, you know, a, a very strong decision. So yeah. it, ask yourself those questions about what images what are the type of images and does that contribute to your story as well yes you know? and i think that's really really important because um we don't have to share everything in our life right it it's, yeah, yeah. It comes back to is what i'm sharing actually connecting back to my ideal client are they do they care about this and sure the raving fans might care about some random kid fact right but by yeah. and large that's not why my audience comes to me to hear some random kid fact about my kid picking his nose or whatever like yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> that's not what they care about they care about how i'm maybe balancing work with motherhood a little bit but that's not even why they come they come because of my personal story yes um, and, and your expertise and how and you expertise. can help them yeah. Yeah. and this is this is something uh, it always comes back to to trust 
right? Mm -hmm. So something I teach my students in Pitch to Press is something called the trust equation. And it gets very nerdy here, but um, bear with me. So trust increases uh -huh. when you are credible. So there's an equation where trust mm -hmm. is on the left-hand side right. and trust goes up when you are credible. So it's credib credibility plus reliability plus consistency. Mm. So your trust goes up when you're more credible, more yep. consistent and more reliable. Yep. But, and at the bottom of the equation is self-orientation. So when you talk about yourself too much, your trust goes down. So actually it's not in your interest. Yeah. You know, it's, this is a very nerdy equation, right? You can Google it. It's called the trust equation. Something I also teach, but if you start putting too much of your lifestyle, mm -hmm. too much, too many images of you, your audience will switch off because you're too self-orientated and the trust yep. goes down. So actually, it's actually quite a nice relief here for anyone who's thinking, do I need to keep putting my image out there? Do I need to promote this sexy lifestyle? No, don't. The trust equation says if you're too self-orientated, <laughs> trust goes down. Yeah. Because you need to be consistent, credible, and reliable, and that comes through your expertise. Yeah. Does that make oh. sense? Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be all about you. <laughs> no, no. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. If you're so, just telling us where you had your avocado in church, and you're not saying, well, actually, I can help you do your PR and get help you get miserable, then people are like, well, she, she's just interested in going for breakfast brunches around London. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, she doesn't care oh. about me or helping me grow my business. It doesn't make any sense. Why do I want to follow her? <laughs> what is one thing that, if you know nothing about PR and you know nothing about getting visibility for your business, yes, other than social media, what is one piece of advice you would give them? Yeah, great, great question. So. Well, a couple of things I would say. First thing is start now. Start yeah. before you think you're ready. Oh, yeah. So many people don't start and they typically say, hey, I don't want to do PR until my business is perfect, until I've got 100 clients to the door um, and everything is just perfect. Mm -hmm. But actually, you have to remember, and this goes back to trust, people take a long time to trust others. Right, yeah. especially in this noisy digital world. Yeah. So one of the things I teach my students in Pitch to Press is this concept called um, the relationship runway. It can mm -hmm. take six months to build trust with someone, mm -hmm. to be invited to speak, to guest teach, to collaborate with them. People have to be in your world a little bit. They have to, know, you know, start mm -hmm. to begin to know, like, and trust you. Mm -hmm. You know, a nice example with us is, yes, our relationship runway was very short. Yeah. But that was because someone else had recommended me. So that was called yeah. Borrow Trust. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. But you had been on my email list. You had downloaded my 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 10 steps to getting into the media guide. So you'd already entered my world for a good, what, three weeks mm -hmm. to see, hang on a minute, do I really want to interview this lady on this podcast? <laughs> so you've got to start now because, yeah. you know, that relationship runway can be anything from one month to six months to 18 mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. so start before you're ready that's yeah. tip number one yeah do that tip number two is i would say if you want to get visible the hardest thing you can do is build an audience from scratch from zero right so what you want to be doing is finding people who are in the same industry as you mm -hmm. but do a complimentary service mm -hmm. who have your audience they share mm -hmm. your audience mm -hmm. right because if you can do a strategic collaboration with those individuals, it is so much easier and so much more efficient to kind of bring people over yeah. from someone else's audience who are already nurtured, i.e. borrow trust, yep. bring them over into your world, then start completely from scratch. So true. I mean, starting from scratch is <laughs> like, why are you making it so yeah. much harder? Yeah. yeah. So a, a little yeah. exercise I recommend here for everyone listening, and this is what I tell my students to do in Pitch to Press, get a blank sheet of paper, put your business in the middle, draw mm -hmm. a circle, say, right, you know, mm -hmm. I do Reiki or I do Pilates or I do, you know, human design, whatever your service is, put it in the circle, in the, in the, in the center of a piece of paper, and then draw lines out and say, right, 
my my ideal client, my classic client, what, what other services is she likely to engage with? If she mm. does human design, if she does yeah. Reiki, if she does, you know, counseling, what it, whatever, what other things would she, would she be interested in? Yeah. You know, and then you can come off with all sorts of ideas. So like, you know, maybe she likes green smoothies. Maybe she likes going to yoga studios. Maybe she likes sound healing. Maybe she's a member of a book club. Maybe she's watching Netflix shows or crime dramas. I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> come up with all the different sideline industries your mm -hmm. ideal client is engaging with and then identify the potential strategic collaborations you can have with the, an expert who shares that audience with you. Mm. How do you approach someone? Say you found somebody that you're like, I think we could collaborate together. How do you approach them in a way that's not going to be I don't know, awkward, weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, this is the whole skill set you need to, everyone needs to build, right? And this is a yeah. fundamental skill set. It's like, how do I pitch to someone? How do I yep. personalize yep. my pictures? The, f the biggest tip I can give you right now for where anyone's at is consume their content. Mm -hmm. Go and listen to mm -hmm. someone's podcast. Go and listen and go and read their articles and get into their world first of all mm. so a little bit like you with me you know yeah um you got into my world to see if I was a good fit I started to get into your world someone recommended you so first of all get into their world and understand what they are producing mm -hmm. listen to their content watch their content on YouTube wherever they are mm -hmm. because once you consume that content you can see if they're a good fit so it's the unsexy stuff first. It's so start true. with the research. Yeah. And this is a bit everyone likes to skip. And oh, when they yeah. skip it, the pictures just go into a black hole. Yeah, and that's so true. I mean, we skip the research on writing copy too and not wanting to do ideal client and actually go and have a conversation with somebody before you create something yes. um, or write something. Yes, that's so, so true. It's It's that invisible research <laughs> yeah so yeah and it doesn't even have to be inv invisible right because you know once you start researching someone you can then start building a relationship mm -hmm. hey rachel i listened to your podcast last week when you interviewed so and so on their human design i really resonated with what you said i really liked it when you talked about x you can leave that as a comment on Instagram and it will stand out. Yeah. You can message that person in a mm -hmm. DM. Mm -hmm. So those little comments will help you start building a relationship with people. Mm -hmm. And that's what I call the relationship runway. And people need to start doing that day not their business. Yeah. And I think even starting with people that aren't like the big name people, because we all know that they have people to handle. Yes comments and all of that kind of stuff that they're likely the actual person you want reading the comment isn't actually reading the comment potentially. Yes. Um, but starting with people that are successful in doing things and know what their message is and you, but they're, they're not like the big names necessarily yet. Right. Yes. They are way more apt to reach back out and be like, Oh my God, thank you. hundred <laughs> percent. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. People tend to go for big names first, yeah. but actually big names. And this applies to whether you're pitching for a podcast, whether you are pitching a magazine mm -hmm. or a high profile influencer, people tend to go to, for those bigger brands, those bigger names first. But what those big brands are looking for is a digital footprint of mm -hmm. where you have been featured before. Oh, true. So I'll give you an example. In my last fashion business, I was, I Googled myself one day and found my name, well, my business name in Harvard Business Review. So for anyone who runs a, biz, a startup or a business, I, for me personally, I think Harvard is, Harvard Business Review is one of the best logo, yeah. media logos you could ever get, right? Yeah. And I was like, how did that happen? Because the journalist hadn't approached me, right? So mm -hmm. I would just name, my, my business was name dropped in this article. It was next to a $50 million company. And I thought, how on earth did that happen? Wow. And this was after 18 months of starting a business, right? The, the one I started in Bali, I, I, <laughs> ironically. Um, and, and then, yeah, it all, it all comes back to Bali. Um, and the interesting, the, 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 it, it dawned on me, I had my light bulb moment then, which was, for 18 months, I had left such a strong digital footprint. Mm. I had been featured by the top influencers in, in the UK. I had been featured in Cosmopolitan magazine, in the Times, the Sunday Times. 
you know, The Guardian, The Independent. I was on lots of podcasts. I was featured in lots of blogs. I was just, you know, visible anywhere and everywhere where it made sense strategically. Mm -hmm. And because of that, a Harvard Business Review journalist Googled my business and saw I was in four pages of the Telegraph. You know, it was a beautiful article I landed. Um, and they were like, yeah, the business is credible. Like 20 journalists and podcasters and bloggers can't be wrong. <laughs> yeah. And so I was, my business was name dropped. That's that awesome. was because I left a big digital footprint. So mm. I really recommend anyone listening today, mm. it just start small and just, you know, start pitching to people. You've got absolutely nothing to lose. Get help, you know, upskill yourself, up level yourself, mm -hmm. do the training and begin to put yourself forward for visibility opportunities because there is a cumulative effect that you won't realize until two years down the line when you mm -hmm. get a feature that you never thought you'd get featured. Yeah. Because you left that digital footprint. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. I need to be better at that. I love that advice. <laughs> so good. Anything else that you would like to leave with the audience today? Yeah, well, um, you know, if people want to come and find out about me, yes. you can come and enter my world. Um, feel yes. free to DM me. Tell me what your main takeaway is from this interview, what you've learned. Did you have some light bulb moments? So I'm over on Instagram at Startups and Co. So that's Startups and Co. So feel free to DM me and, and say hi. I always love to hear people. Um, the other thing I've got going on is... Um, if you are really interested in getting super visible and you're thinking, you know, wow, I really want to do this, but, um, you know, I don't really have the skills or I'm lacking a little bit of confidence. And I want to grow my business. Um, you can go to my um, website, which is pitchedpress.com, And I've got a free three page guide on how you can start pitching yourself to the media. And that's a really lovely little three page guide. I think you've downloaded it. Right? It's so really good. Yeah, absolutely. It's totally. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And it actually, it actually works for not just pitching to magazine articles mm -hmm. and things that you might think might be a little bit too sexy, but, um, you know, for podcasters as well, because there's a whole little piece yeah. of researching and how you do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's a really nice resource to, to, to download. And, um, yeah, once you've downloaded that, then you'll be in my world and I will then share with you like lots of opportunities and classes and summits that I run twice a year. So yeah. yeah feel free to just enter my world that way. Yay. Awesome. I love it. And you want to be on her email list. Her emails are fabulous. I like, and I, I don't say that lightly because I am a, on a lot of email lists. Yeah. I always open yours. I love yours. I love that. I love that. You know, I've been in rooms with people. You'll, you'll love it. I was in New York City recently about, what, three weeks ago. And um, I went for dinner with someone and I recognized this lady's face because she had been on a summit that I had been on. And then um, she messaged me on Instagram and she said, you know what, I am on your email list. I read your email. <laughs> I, I, I keep coming across people who are on my email list and I, I have no idea anymore who's on there. <laughs> <laughs> who isn't, so. Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh yeah. I, love it. I need to get, I do, I do offer calls to people on my email list, you know, like once a month I say, Hey, I've got five spots. I'd love to get to know people. Uh, and those spots go very quickly. So, like that. Like um, that. yeah, it's always fun. I like to connect with everyone on my list, but I still don't know who they all are. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh, thank you so much, Adela. You have been fabulous. And I know that there's been so many takeaways from so many takeaways from this interview. So, so grateful that you were here today. Oh, thank you so much, Rachel, for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure to, to talk to everyone here today. So thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.